Good morning, everyone. We are here with Jesse Reagan with Preferred Lending Solutions. And one of the things that's been popping up a lot in our marketplace right now has been a whole bunch of brand new buyers into the market. Our Generation Z, our millennials are jumping into the market and credit has been a problem. Not from, a, you know, not from the standpoint of bad credit, but a standpoint of no credit at all. So Jesse's here to kind of un, you know, uncork some of the myths that have been running around and help us navigate what to do and how to do it. So Jesse, thanks so much for joining us, man. Good morning, Robbie. Thanks for having me. Yeah, I recently read a report that stated that 45% of Gen Zers were planning on buying a house in the next five years. So I think it's important that we tackle these issues now. That way, our, our first-time homebuyers are better prepared when they get into the marketplace. Perfect. So, you know, first things first, we probably need to jump in and, you know, for, for those folks, Gen Zs and millennials, what give us some basics on credit, what to look for? Oh, sure. Sure. So your credit report is going to comprise of three different bureaus that report. There's going to be Experian, Equifax and TransUnion. You'll hear the word FICO. FICO and credit score are, are one and the same. For the purpose of a mortgage, we're going to use the, the middle of the three credit scores between the three credit bureaus that do report. Um, so, you know, you'll hear the word FICO. But that does mean your credit score. Gotcha. So we've got we got FICO score. We talked about the three the three that are out there. What are some of the you know determining factors that'll help determine how high or low you are? You know where, what your score is, and of course what you know what do you need to be too to be able sure, to buy? sure. So your credit scores are going to range anywhere from three hundred to eight fifty. The oh. national average on credit score is around seven hundred, just shy of seven hundred. For the purpose of purchasing a home. Um, your government loans are going to require a minimum of 580. But of course, the higher we can get that score, the better off you're going to be in, in regards to qualifying, get a lower interest rate. So we want to get that up as high as possible. But um, so typically speaking, 680 plus is where we want to be to yield the best interest rates. Um, so, yeah, anywhere between, you know, 580 to 850 is going to be where you'll qualify for a mortgage, depending on other factors, of course. So some of the other factors I know we've got, you know, uh, balances compared to highs? What are some of those sure. other factors that are out there? Sure. So we'll kind of go over the five main factors that contribute to your credit score. And we'll start with the most important. And that's going to be your payment history. Um, it's the single largest factor. Uh, we'll dive into how to establish credit shortly. But I wanted to emphasize on how important it is to pay your bills. Um, you know, most of your creditors are going to have a built in grace period, whether it be a credit card or an installment loan, they're going to give you 10 to 15 days after the due date before they assess a late payment. But all of them will report to the bureaus when you're 30 days late. So um, if you fall a little behind, it's OK to be a little late. You may incur a late fee, but by all means, do not be more than 30 days late because the payment history is going to contribute to 35 percent of your credit score. It's, it's a huge wow. trend. So, you know, that's that's actually I mean, we've seen and you could probably speak to this better. A 30 day late can impact somebody's credit score between the difference between getting a loan and not being able to qualify altogether. Correct. I mean, time heals all wounds. So whenever you have a 30 day late, it takes time for that to heal. It, it serves as a blanket and it kind of weighs your credit score down. So the further you get out from a 30 day late, your credit score is going to start to improve. So if you have a lease coming up and it expires in six months and you want to prepare yourself to purchase a home in that time frame, having that 30 day late could be a hindrance on you getting approved um, in that time frame. So pay your bills on time. Definitely don't be more than 30 days late. So speaking of bills being on time, I know we also have balances, you know, in, in reference to, you know, we got a max balance and how much can you carry? Yes. You know, some people like to ride the line and, you know, essentially kind of ride the, the gas tank on E, so to speak. So. Talk Correct. So, yeah, while, while the uh, the payment history accounts for 35 percent of your score, the, the amounts owed account for 30 percent. So it's all about the balance in relation to your high credit limit. So, for an example, if you have a credit card with a thousand dollar high credit balance, high credit limit, um, you want to keep that at 30 percent or lower. So you always want to maintain a balance of 30 percent of the high credit limit or lower. Um, so if you have a thousand dollar high credit uh, limit, you want to keep that balance at three hundred dollars or lower. You don't necessarily want to pay off the cards because we're going to speak about that in a little bit. Uh, but the length of credit history is that you want to keep those accounts active and going. So paying them off may actually 
um, be a hindrance to your, your credit score because they want to see that you have the ability to maintain credit for a long period of time. But, but if, if possible, maintain that balance at 30% or less. And you can always reach out. Let's say that you had to charge, you had a, an emergency, you have to max out the credit card. Reach out to the creditor and ask if they will ex, uh, extend your high credit limit. That way you can try to get that ratio down. Gotcha. So what I guess what I'm hearing is, you know, if you end up, if you're one of those that loves to pay your bills off every single month, you don't like, like owing anybody any money, which, you know, Lord knows the, the, the banks would love that. But in order to be able to establish that credit, it almost looks like you've got no credit at all. Correct. Correct. That's a good segue into the next factor, which is going to be the length of credit history that accounts for 15% of your credit score. And so the way that the algorithms and the system works with the credit bureaus is that they want to see that you have the ability to maintain credit for a long period of time. So let's say that you get that first credit card at 18 years old. You want to keep that credit card open for a long period of time, whether or not you just put one tank of gas on it a month or you do uh, you pay one utility bill on it a month. You want to be able to charge on it and then pay it down, charge on it, pay it down. And it just shows that you have that stability and, and the ability to maintain that credit. So keep those accounts open for a long period of time. You don't have to max them out. Keep those balances low, but don't don't just close them out and open up a new one, close them out, and open up a new one. Keep those old ones because it will help you out long term. Gotcha. And one, one of the other things on balances for those you know that are out there, if you hate the idea of having interest get in charge, keep your balance at like 10 bucks. Correct. You know, the 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 interest, the interest charge that you're on there is is minimal. So and at least it still it follows in line with what Jesse's talking about. It keeps, you know, it keeps credit showing that you've got the availability. It got your DTI way down or debt to income way down. All of those things are things that, you know, and of course, if you keep it from the time you're 18 on the, you know, on into well into college, as long as you're disciplined and keeping those keeping those balances down, it'll it'll bode well for you when it's time to make that purchase. So the other super popular question that we get, this is not necessarily tied to Gen Z or millennials, is credit pulls. So, you know, if you're going in and house shopping, you know, and you're maybe some people like to make a habit of calling 10 lenders just to see who could end up getting the best deal. That, you know, what does that look like and how does that affect the score? Sure. So new credit inquiries do, they account for about 10% of your credit score. So a new credit inquiry on credit cards, auto loans, each time that you pull that, let's say you're going to purchase a vehicle and the dealership pulls it 10 different times. Well, that's going to have a negative impact on your score. So we want to keep that to a minimum. Just go to your credit union, go to your bank, get a pre-approval letter and go to that dealership with your pre-approval letter showing that you already have your financing lined up and you'll be able to avoid all of those multiple inquiries. Credit cards are the same way. If you get denied, you just don't want to keep applying, keep applying. It just shows that desperation and it just doesn't, it doesn't, yeah. Um, but when it comes to mortgage pools, so, uh, you know, when you go on to purchase a mortgage, if you shop around to 10 different banks, 10 different mortgage banks within a 30 day period of time, it only counts as one inquiry to your credit report. So it doesn't affect it as much. And these credit inquiries will refresh every 12 months. So keep that in mind as well. So we just want to keep those to a minimum if possible. So, you know, I hear this all the time. Is, Man, I don't want to pull my credit because I'm worried about it dropping. What, you know, if we're only having these multiple, you know, if you get this 30 day grace period to be able to pull your credit to go and shop other lenders, what were some of the things that people are assuming that it's because of the credit pull? Could it be, it could, I guess it could be balances or something like that, right? Correct. So on the credit reports that we pull, it's going to give us what's affecting the credit score from, from, um, you know, priority all the way down. And so we'll be able to let the, the borrower know what's affecting the credit score, whether it be balances, whether it be any lates or collections, uh, any kind of derogatory credit, it's going to kind of list that priority for us. Um, you know, I find that, you know, pulling your credit with multiple banks for the purpose of a mortgage, it may affect your score one or two points. But unfortunately, we need that information to be able to give you a pre-approval letter. Um, so it's just one of those evil necessities. You kind of have to do it. So hopefully you can do it within a 30 day window and then it will only uh, count as one inquiry to your credit report. Gotcha. So now we kind of got the basics down. You know, if I'm brand new, don't have a credit score. Where do I start? Yep. So um, what I would recommend doing is if we have a savings account, let's say we have some money at the house in the safe. We have some money in your savings account at the bank. What we want to do 
We got high school graduates popping in. That's it. High school graduates. Right now, graduation I got an 18 year old over at the house right now. This is a perfect opportunity for them. So it is, it is. So if they have a thousand dollars save, for example, let's go to the bank and let's, let's ask if we can secure an installment loan against your money. So basically you take a thousand dollars that you already have in the bank and the bank is going to give you a loan and it's going to be secured against your money. One, it's going to give you a low interest rate because it's a safe risk for them because it's your money. It's going to tie up that money for that, that, uh, that period. So let's say you do a 12 month installment loan. Um, so basically you're going to borrow your money. You're going to pay back a little bit of interest. But the important thing is that whatever financial institution you use, whether it be a bank or credit union, you want to make sure that they're going to report this type of loan to all three credit bureaus. That way, it's a good safe way. You don't have a, a credit card out there that you can max out or, or get out of hand. It's basically you're using your own money and securing a loan against it. You report it for 12 months and that's going to give you a good track record and that's going to really kickstart your credit score. I think you know, you, you'd made a, a point on one of them, especially the 18 year olds. Mm -hmm. Use it for a tank of gas a month, pay it down to 10 bucks. Correct. And if you get it down to 10 bucks and put it up. <laughs> That's it. That's it. Put if you it put it up, you put it, you know, you diligent set, set a reminder in your phone, buy a tank of gas with it, keep it down to $10, make sure you pay it on time. And then within 12 months, you're a thousand steps ahead of darn near everybody else that's in the market. Cause when you know, a lot of people don't think about getting a loan until a, they find a house on, you know, online and they fall in love and they're like, Jesse, you need to go. Right. I got yeah. nothing. <laughs> nothing, nothing worse than falling in love, falling in love with a house that you can't buy. So oh, wow. uh, yeah, let's be proactive. And, um, you know, you, we can apply that same principle of using your own money and securing against the loan, but we can secure it against a credit card. So a bank will also allow you to use the money that you have in the savings account and they're going to secure a credit card and they're going to tie that high credit limit to whatever balance you have in the savings account. And the beauty of doing both an installment loan where you're going to pay it back in 12 equal installments or a credit card is it gives you what's called a credit mix. And this accounts for 10% of your credit score. So a credit mix, what is the perfect credit score? Well, the general rule of thumb is a mortgage, two cars, two credit cards that usually pay all that on time over a long period of time. You're going to get that perfect credit score. So getting that credit mix is important. So if we can do that out the gate and utilize that thousand dollars, we split it up. We borrow 500 against an installment, 500 against a credit card, and we have a good track record for 12 months. That gives you the credit mix. It gives you the length of the credit history you need, all payments made on time. I mean, it's the perfect formula to really get you out the gates with a good credit score and be able to apply for that mortgage. So I'm, a, I'm an instant gratification guy, and I know this takes a little bit of process. So the best way to monitor, you know, my progress, I want to see what's happening. I can, I can check, you know, whether it's, you know, once a year, twice a year, monthly, you know, I don't know what, what's out there. What's, what's out there for a credit monitoring standpoint? Sure. So you've heard of all, you've seen all the commercials, you've heard of all the free credit report services, whether it be creditkarma.com, freecreditreport.com. All of those are great services to monitor your credit, to make sure that there's nothing that's going to be popping up that can hurt you in the future. Um, there's no uh, identity theft, things of that nature. But just keep in mind that the algorithm used to purchase a vehicle or to get a credit card is going to be different than the algorithm used when you're pulling a residential mortgage credit report. The risk to a bank is far greater if you're going to be buying a house rather than giving you an auto loan. So the algorithm use is going to be a lot stricter. So I'll find a lot of times that the clients will come in and say, look, Credit Karma is telling me I have a 700. And then when I pull it, it's a 650. And they, they ask why. Well, it's, it's due to the algorithm. It's just a greater risk. So it's going to be more stringent. And that's why we're typically. So just to manage expectations, if you see it on creditkarma.com, more than likely, it's going to be lower whenever you go to pull it with a, a mortgage banker. Uh, but it's still good to have. It's a good tool to have to monitor your credit as you build this to make sure that there's uh, nothing in error popping up, um, which, which kind of leads me to a, another way that you could build credit. It's not my favorite way to build credit, but it is a way to build credit. And that's becoming an authorized user. An authorized user, it does report to the credit bureaus. Um, but you have to choose wisely. You have to make sure that the person that you're piggybacking on has good credit. They have good financial uh, history. And because ultimately, if they miss a payment, it's going to affect your score. So we want to make sure that whoever you choose, 
that they're going to be a, a good steward of you being an authorized user on their account. Um, so I would say that's a last ditch. But let's say that you do do that. And then by having the credit room.com, it's going to allow you to monitor their payment history as well. That way you can get off of it if, if they're falling on hard times. Gotcha. That's all great, great tips, man. Um, if, if I'm, if I'm going on the, these, you know, I'm at my, the very beginning, I put that thousand dollars to be able to secure it over at the bank. Everything's reporting over to the, uh, you know, it's reporting over to the credit bureaus. When would you recommend if somebody's in the market to potentially buy a house to reach out to you to start that first pull? <laughs> Sure. So if you let the credit bureaus report organically and you let that score come up, I would say six months would probably be a good time frame. Um, and let's say like you you would rather rent for a while before you enter into the, the housing market. Well, rental history is also very important. So we want to make sure that if you are renting two things, we want to make sure that we pay on time because we have to do a verification of rent possibly down the road. And we want to make sure we pay via check. Uh, paying via cash, uh, it's not traceable. So if you pay via check or Venmo or any other service that we can actually establish a paper trail, we can actually use your rental history to serve as a credit profile as well. Let's say your credit score hasn't uh, picked up high enough to get us a solid loan approval. We may have to lean on a, res uh, a rental history to be able to, as a compensating factor, be able to build strength and your ability to buy a house. So um, I would say six months. If you're starting right out the gate, and you do everything we just spoke about, I would say give it six months, give me a shout, we'll pull it, we'll see where we stand. And the credit report that I pull is gonna give us the score as it is now, and it's also gonna give us potential score improvement. It'll actually tell me exactly what we have to do to get that score to a certain level. So you know, one other thing that just kind of made me think about it, if I'm renting right now, I'm a college student that's renting, I've been in there for six months, but I have zero credit. Mm -hmm. Is this, do we need, is six months a good start? Cause we, we can do this if we've got our, you know, we've got our internet bill or our utility bill. All of these are some some potential trade lines that could build scores. Is that a is that an opportunity to maybe talk to you a little bit earlier? It, it really depends on the credit score. So whenever we run it through a, an automated underwriting system, it's going to tell us whether or not the credit profile is strong enough for us to proceed as is, or if it's going to require that we have alternative trade lines such as car insurance, gym membership, um, things with a twelve month track record. So if, if we have low credit score, it's not established enough, we may have to wait 12 months to get that 12 month rental history to get those alternative trade lines. I know a lot of times you're still on your parents' health insurance, you're still on your parents' cell phone bill. So those things won't necessarily uh, work in our favor. So we want to make sure that we have some other alternative trade lines, whether it be the, um, you know, a gym membership or it, it be, you know, utility bill, a cable bill, a Hulu account. I mean, all of those things will play into building an alternative credit profile. We don't have the credit score necessary right out the gate. Awesome, man. That's all great information. Jesse, thanks so much for, for joining and answering a lot of questions. Um, where can they find you? All right. So you can uh, reach me at jessereagan.com. That's J-E-S-S-E-R-E-G-A-N or easier donedealnow.com. And you can find me there as well. Hit the apply button. You know, I, I, I do think it's probably not, you know, you guys are in the market, happen to be buying. It's always great to at least have a conversation because, you know, you may be one of those in-betweeners that, that doesn't have, that you may not have a credit score, but there could be an opportunity to wiggle, wiggle your way into something. And at least, you know, I'm, I'm a big fan of ready, aim, fire, not ready, fire, aim. So if you talk to the professionals like Jesse, who really know their stuff, they can put you in the right direction. Don't skip steps. You know, he's got these things down to a science there. You know, their systems are set up to be able to maximize the credit score, which ultimately pushes down the, the rate, which means you can afford more house for the money that you're borrowing. So, again, thank you so much, Jesse, for, uh, you, for coming on out with us. Really appreciate it, man. Thank you. Bye, y'all. Bye.